Hey, give me one second while I'm getting this fixed. This is my first ever going live right now. And if you can't hear me, we'll get that fixed in just one second. I just want to be able to see. I'm trying to, oh, there we go. I found it, I found it, I found it, I found it. Okay, let's see. There is our vocabulary, our vocabularies on there. Yes, and then tonight we are going over the introduction. And if you would like to see the introduction on my blog, here's the link and it's right under the uh let's see i'm gonna put i'm gonna put it i'm gonna put it right here there we go so there are things that i'm going to be reading that have footnotes on it so let's see yes so on my blog i did put the footnotes so if that makes sense Mm. Is it working? Oh. Yes, yes it is. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so let's see. Have I given you everything that... Okay, now, um, this is my first live video actually going over one of the lesson plans. So what I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm going to go ahead and post the other blog that I did right under here because cause it was like, it was less, right now I'm talking about lesson two, but it's the introduction, but lesson one was talking about race and racism and it's got some really good points and also like, if you don't know what implicit bias is, I've got, um, I live in San Antonio and there's a really awesome activist who did a TED talk on implicit bias and how it's worked out in her life and how um, she did a high school experience that was really awesome and it really, I wish, I wish every high school would do that. But it talks about implicit bias and then thing, it, it's got a lot of videos that kind of like show you different things of like how you see things the way you're thinking. Just go to it. Here, I'll go ahead and, but no, let me see. This one right here. I will, here it is. It's lesson one and it's how to talk about race and racism and it shows you a bunch of like really good videos of like social experiments where it's done it. You know, kind of like um, that, oh, it's a series on TV. It's like, what would you have done or something like that? So I'm hoping that it's posting what I'm supposed to. Oh, I've got it pinned. Okay, so the very first video is about how to talk about race and racism. Um, if you get in comfort, it kind of, it, it gives you some self tips on how comfortable am I talking about it? Like me personally, how, you know, and, and you don't have to tell anybody how you feel, just we're going through the motions. So, so read this and kind of get in your head, you know, answer the questions, honestly, you know, how do you feel personally, you know, talking about it? And that's, that's completely okay. And then, so, but tonight I'm going to go through a guided reading of the introduction. So, because honestly, if I read the entire introduction out loud, it would take an entire hour and nobody's got time for that. But on my blog, on this post, I have a link to the audio that is the like audio book and it's the entire first introduction. So, and I need to say I'm using, um, I'm using teaching tolerances lesson plan for uh, the Jim Crow and I'm pretty much going just by a lesson plan. I mean, and I've really read over it and I just really love it and it gets to the nitty gritty parts and I think this is a really important book and the reason why I'm doing this is because I've had a lot of friends reach out to me um, throughout the last three years and ask me questions and then I've also reached out to a bunch of my friends and this has been one of the books that I really really want people to go get but I know that people are so busy with their life and doing this that they're probably not going to go get a book let alone have time to read it so I thought well I'll read it for you. <laughs> I'll, I'll help you. So, um, first things first. And this is kind of, this is geared, like, I'm from Arkansas. I mean, and I'm from rural Arkansas. So, and, you know, good old folks that, they, that don't know no better. I mean, 
we were purposely not told things for a reason. So that's why I'm like, I've got to tell everybody this. So listen, so first let's go over let's go over the vocabulary super fast. If you know it, you know it, and that's great, but there might be someone that doesn't, and, and that's what I'm here for. So bias, an inclination of temperament or outlook, especially a personal and sometimes unreasoned judgment, you know, like being prejudiced. Okay, a cast. Now, I know that if you grew up in Greenwood, Arkansas, I had Mr. Furlow as like a fine arts teacher, and I think he's the only one that ever mentioned like a social cast and actually said like two or three paragraphs that were really super awesome. And I was like, oh. And so his definition, I don't know, I even know what it was, but I know that that's the time that I remember hearing cast and the way he explained it. Mr. Furlow, fine arts. I love that man. So I remember hearing it, and that was the last time I heard it. Well, until this book. And then I was like, oh my God. Like, I always heard that definition. I remember what he told me, but I never could put it into real life until now. But a caste is a division of society based on differences of wealth, inherited rank or privilege, profession, occupation, or race. And it gets like super deep, like super, super deep. So, color blindness, like when people say they're colorblind, it's the notion that race does not matter. Okay, and that would be great. And there's a lot of people that they're like, I love you no matter who you are. That's not what we're talking about when they say color blindness. Like, you don't know the racist mortgage broker that said these 15 people could live on that side of the railroad tracks and these 15 people didn't have to. It's it's one of those, this is supposed to explain kind of, th I love this book because it really touches on mass incarceration and, um, system, you know, systematic racism. And then hierarchy, the classification of a group of people according to the ability or economic, social, or professional standing. Okay. Jim Crow was the ethnic discrimination, especially against blacks by legal enforcement and trades and traditional sanctions. So like black water fountain, white water fountain, black part of town, white part of town, but it got much deeper than that. So mass incarceration, and this is, and I love, I love, I love this version of it. And it's from her book refers not only to the criminal justice system, but a larger web of laws, rules, policies, and customs that control those labeled criminals, both in and out of prison. That's a, that's a big, that's a big thing, in and out of prison. Stereotype, a widely held but fixed and oversimplified image or idea of a particular type of person or thing. A stigma, an association of disgrace or public disapproval with something, such as an action or condition. Um, I have uh, bipolar, so I fall under, you know, mental stigma, you know, whatnot. So, um, but there's, you know, people who have disabilities, they have a bit of a stigma about them. Um, people who used to be ex drug users, you know, um, and an apartheid. Racial segregation, former policy of segregation and political and economic discrimination against non-whites. Okay, so that's our, that's our vocabulary. And I've went ahead and I've put it there just in case we need it. So, let me see. The first lesson on my blog is talking about how to talk about race and racism. And it's just like a prep to this. This is actually the introduction of the book. And I am using um, the teaching tolerance lesson plan for the new Jim Crow. And um, I just... I'm doing this for all the times before I realized what was going on and for all the friends that I had that I didn't say what I was supposed to say or I didn't stand up for them. Like, I know what's going on and I'm... Uh, that's why I'm doing this. Like, we're doing this. <laughs> so, we're going to do a guided... Like, if I read to you the entire first chapter of The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander, it would take me every bit of an hour. And like I said, nobody has time for that. So I'm gonna go through the guided reading through teaching tolerance, just like a lesson plan, just like if, if we were in a class. And the whole point of this is this, this is summed up basically the mass of the chapter. And then I just want you to listen and then I'm probably gonna ask some questions and just kind of think about it and mill over it. And then if you want to know the entire chapter, go to my blog, www.southernfriedsocialist.com and go to the New Jim Crow Lesson 2, okay? And down at the very bottom, I, I had the audiobook link to um, Introduction 1 so you can hear the entire 45 minutes by the author. And um, 
I'm not making any money off of this. I need to say that. And I'm not affiliated with Teaching Tolerance. I just believe in them. And I'm not affiliated with Michelle Alexander, but I just love this book. And I think it's really important. So, Jarvius Cotton cannot vote. Like his father, grandfather, great-grandfather, and great-great-grandfather, he has been denied the right to participate in our electoral democracy. Cotton's family tree tells us the story of several generations of black men who were born in the United States, but who were denied the most basic freedom that democracy promises, the freedom to vote for those who will make the rules and laws that govern one's life. Cotton's great-great-grandfather could not vote as a slave. His great-grandfather was beaten to death by a Ku Klux Klan member for attempting to vote. His great-grandfather, or his grandfather, was prevented from voting by Klan intimidation. His father was barred from voting by poll taxes and literacy tests. Today, Jarvius Cotton cannot vote because he, like many other black men in the United States, have been labeled a felon and is currently on parole. So... Think about that for a minute. Think about that entire summary for a minute. Um, how many generations do you think that is? How many years does that span that that entire family was not allowed to vote? It's kind of like generational poverty, you know? Um, how many... That's a lot of years, y'all. Th think about that. And while you're thinking about that, think about how many generations that was. And, I mean, he couldn't vote because he was a slave. And then just year after year after year, there was something else that was put into place that made it to where he basically, you know, couldn't, couldn't participate in the process. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to uh, paste that footnote for you right there because it actually was a uh, case that you can look up and all of the footnotes for the book are on the blog www.southernfriedsocialist.com and it's under the New Jim Crow Lesson 2. Moving on. Cotton's story illustrates in many respects the old adage, the more things change, the more things stay the same. In each generation, new tactics have been used for achieving the same goals, goals shared by the Founding Fathers. Denying African Americans citizenship was deemed essential to the formation of the original Union. Hundreds of years later, America is still not an egalitarian democracy. An extraordinary percentage of black men in the United States are legally barred from voting today, just as they have been throughout most of American history. They are also subject to legalized discrimination in employment, housing, education, public benefits, and jury service, just as their parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents once were. So, the Founding Fathers, when you look at, like, people who want to keep talking, this is me talking, this is not me reading the garden, but I just recently, and with recent news, I'm talking about the Confederate statues, and just all of this stuff, like, I mean, goals of the Founding Fathers. I mean, what specific goals do you think that the author's referring to right here? I mean, that they can't vote. For, for some strange reason, the reason why Cotton's great-great-grandfather can't vote every single year down to him, there's been a reason why he can't vote. Systematic, institutionalized racism. So, so just, you know, as we're going... In the era of colorblindness, and colorblindness means when you think that race doesn't matter, and that would be happy and go lucky if race didn't matter, but there are policies and legislation and different kinds of ways that that's simply not true. They go through it through, through um, this. In the era of colorblindness, it is no longer socially permissible to use race explicitly as a justification for discrimination, exclusion, and social contempt. So we don't. Rather than rely on race, we use our criminal justice system to label people of color, color criminals and then enrage or engage in all other practices we supposedly left behind. Today, is perfect, today, it is perfectly legal to discriminate against criminals in nearly all ways that it once was legal to discriminate against African Americans. As a criminal, you have scarcely 
more rights and arguably less respect than a black man living in Alabama at the height of Jim Crow. We have not ended racial caste in America. We have merely redesigned it. And then from here on out, it kind of goes on the author and how she came to realize, and she does a wonderful TED Talk on this. I need to put it on the blog. But the author goes on from here to talk about how she first came to realize this. I mean, um, I'm a white girl who grew up in rural Arkansas. I kind of had a feeling something wasn't right since I was very little, but nobody understood what I was talking about, at least in that town, but I guess now I know why. Um, but anyway, but um, going back to the lesson. I first encountered the idea of a racial caste system more than a decade ago when a bright orange poster caught my eye. I was rushing to catch the bus and I noticed a sign stapled to the telephone pole that screamed in large bold print, the drug war is the new Jim Crow. I paused for a moment, skimmed the text of the flyer. Some radical group was holding a community meeting about police brutality, the new three strikes law in California, and the expansion of Americans' prison system. The meeting was being held at a small community church a few blocks away. It had seating capacity for no more than 50 people. I sighed and muttered to myself something like, yeah, the criminal justice system is racist in many ways, but it really doesn't help to make such an absurd comparison. People will just think you're crazy. I then crossed the street and hopped on the bus. I was headed to my new job, Director of Racial Justice Project of the American Civil Liberties Union, the ACLU, in Northern California. So, even like what I told you earlier, um, how I, I grew up in rural Arkansas, and it took me a lot. I'm 27 now. I, I guess I've come around faster than others, but I came around. She even was like, I think that's crazy, until she's, she, and this is the author of the book, she used to think the same way, and in her TED Talk, she really elaborates this, and, and I really like it, but anyway, when I began my work at the ACLU, I assumed that the criminal justice system had problems of racial bias, much in the same way that all major institutions in our society are plagued with problems associated with conscious and unconscious bias. Unconscious bias. Um, there's a TED Talk by Denise Hernandez, a super awesome activist, and uh, talks about um, implicit bias. And I think, you know, go look it up. It's on my blog. I posted it. Anyway, back on track. As a lawyer who had litigated numerous class action employment discrimination cases, I understood well too many ways in which racial stereotyping had permeated subject decision-making processes at all level of an organization with devastating consequences. By the time I left the ACLU, I had come to suspect that I was wrong about the criminal justice system. It was not just another institution infected with racial bias, but rather a different beast entirely. The activists who'd posted the sign on the telephone pole were not crazy, nor were they smattering facts of lawyers and advocates around the country who were beginning to connect the dots between our current system of mass incarceration and the earlier forms of social control. Quite belatedly, I came to see that mass incarceration in the United States had in fact emerged as a stunningly comprehensive and well-disguised system of racialized social control that functions in a manner strikingly similar to the new or to Jim Crow. So it was I mean Michelle Alexander I mean the ACLU I mean this is a and she's a lawyer, the lawyer for the ACLU. I mean, she knows what she's talking about. And just in my stint of being around organizations and working with them, you see so much that you never even imagined. Or like the way that things really work. And sometimes it's, a lot of the time, it's really unsettling. But, so, I mean, oh girl's got a story. In my experience, people who have been incarcerated rarely have diff difficulty identifying the parallels between these systems of self social control. 
Once they are released, they are often denied the right to vote, excluded from juries, regulated to racially segregated and subordinate existence through a web of laws, regulation, informal rules, all of which are powerfully enforced by a social stigma. They are confined to the margins of mainstream society and denied access to the mainstream economy. They are legally denied the ability to obtain employment, housing, and public benefits. Much as African Americans were once forced into segregated second-class citizenship in the new Jim or in the Jim Crow era. So, rewind that if you have to. I'm going to put it on my blog. Moving on, and then also, let me see. La 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 la. Ooh, right here. Um, we're about to go into Ronald Reagan, and uh, I'm about. Oh, I'm a couple minutes into this at least. So, we're going to have a bunch of footnotes. So, and I'm going to post them in the comment section right here so that you can look them up at your leisure um, in case you think I'm lying to you. And also, they are on my blog, www.southernfriedsocialist.com, New Jim Crow Lesson 2. I have a vocabulary that goes over um, different words that some people might not be familiar with or it's been a while since they've heard them. Um, I know that I needed to check things out again. There's no shame in that. Um, and also, it has all the footnotes for the um, paragraph that I'm reading. So anyway. President Ronald Reagan officially announced the current drug war in 1982. Before crack became an issue in the media or a crisis in poor black neighborhoods, a few years after the drug war was declared, crack, became, <laughs> crack began to spread rapidly in the poor black neighborhoods of Los Angeles and later emerged in cities across the country. The Reagan administration hired staff to publicize the emergence of crack cocaine in 1985 as a part of a strategic effort to build public and legislative support for the war. The media campaign was an, extraordin was an extraordinary success. Almost overnight, the media was saturated with images of black crack whores, crack dealers, crack babies, images that seemed to confirm the worst negative racial stereotypes about impoverished inner-city residents. The media bonanza surrounding the new demon drug helped catapult the war on drugs from an ambitious, um, ambitious federal policy to an actual war. The impact of the drug war had been astounding. In less than 30 years, the U.S. penal population exploded from around 300,000 to more than 2 million. In 300,000 to 2 million, the drug convictions accounting for the majority of the increase. The United States now had the highest rate of incarceration in the world, dwarfing the rates of nearly every developed country, even surpassing those in highly rep repressive regimes like Russia, China, and Iran. In Germany, 93 people are in prison for every 100,000 adults and children. In the United States, the rate is roughly eight times that, or 750 per 100,000. Wow. So now I'm going to put the footnotes um, one through uh, four into the post below. Well, two through four at least. So that you can search what I've said while you're milling over that last point that I said. Can you believe that? Like, seriously. We have more people in jail than Russia. And everybody's like, Russia, Russia, Russia. It's like Marsha off of the Brady Bunch. So, these racial dimen the, the racial dimension of mass incarceration is, most, is, the, is its most striking feature. No other country in the world imprisons so many of its racial or ethnic minorities. The United States imprisons a larger percentage of its black population than South Africa did at the height of the apartheid. And remember earlier, the apartheid, here is, yes, racial segregation. 
Racial segregation, a former policy of segregation and political and economic discrimination against non-white groups in the Republic of South Africa. That's what I've got noted here because that's what you can look up because it's probably where it was probably most known. So, like, wow. Okay, so. Uh, in Washington, D.C., our nation's capital, it is estimated that three out of four young black men and nearly all of those in the poorest neighborhoods can expect to serve time in prison. Similar rates of incarceration can be found in black communities across America. These stark racial disparities cannot be explained by rates of drug crime. Studies show that people of all color use and sell illegal drugs at remarkably similar rates. If there are a significant difference in the surveys to be found, they frequently suggest that whites, particularly white youth, are more likely to engage in drug crime than people of color. That is not what one would guess. However, when entering our nation's prisons and jails, which are overflowing with black and brown drug offenders. So, let's see. We've got until seven. So, let me go ahead and put five, six, and seven um, footnotes down here for you to search if you want to. just to make sure. There we go. Roll time. So, the author points out that high rates of incarceration for drug, offender, for drug offenders across African American men do not correspond with the actual rates of drug crime. So, what then do you think explains the racial disparities in the U.S. prison system. Um, I am reading ex excerpts that do pertain to um, the paragraph that I'm reading, but if you want the entire um, introduction, I have a link to the entire introduction at the very end of this post on my blog where it's the author reading her entire introduction. It's about 43 minutes, and I'm just hitting the highlights, but it's at www.southernfriedsocialist.com. Um, let me see. The stark and sobering reality is that for reasons largely unrelated to actual crime trends, the American <coughs> penal system has emerged as a system of social control that's unparalleled in the world, in world history. And while the size of the system alone might suggest that it would touch the lives of most American, the primary most Americans, the primary targets of its social control can be defined largely by race. This is an, this is an astonishing development, especially given that as recently as the mid-1970s, the most well-respected criminal law criminologists were predicting that prison systems would soon fade away. The growing consensus among experts was perhaps best reflected by the National Advisory Commission on Criminal Justice Standards and Goals, which issued a recommendation in 1973 that no new institutions for adults should be built and existing institutions for juveniles should be closed." End quote. And that's got a footnote with it. This recommendation was based on their finding that the prison and reformatory and the jail had this recommend this is a quote. This recommendation was based on their finding that the prison, the reformatory, and the jail had achieved only a shocking record of failure. There is overwhelming evidence that these institutions create crime rather than prevent it. Despite the unprecedented levels of incarceration in the African American community, the civil rights community is oddly quiet. One in three young African American men will serve time in prison if current trends continue, and in some cities, more than half of all young adult black men are currently under congressional control in a prison or jail or probation or parole. Yet mass incarceration tends in tends to be categorized as a criminal justice issue as opposed to a racial justice or civil rights issue or crisis. So, I don't know if you understood what I just said. Let me go over it one more time. Despite the unprecedented levels 
of incarceration in the African American community, the civil rights community is oddly quiet. One in three, one in three African American men will serve time in prison if current trends continue. And in some cities, more than half of all young adult men are currently under correctional control, in prison or in jail, on probation or parole. Yet mass incarceration tends to be categorized as a criminal justice issue as opposed to a racial justice and civil rights issue. Or crisis. It's a crisis. The elected leaders of the African American community have a much broader mandate than the civil rights group, but they too frequently over look criminal justice. In January 2009, for example, the Congressional Black Caucus sent a letter to hundreds of community and organization leaders who have worked in the caucus for over years soliciting general information about them and requesting that they identify their priorities. More than 35 topics were listed as areas of potential as potential special interest including taxes, defense, immigration, agriculture, housing, banking, higher education, multimedia, transportation, and infrastructure, women and seniors, nutrition, faith incentives, civil rights, census and economic security, and emerging leaders. No mention was made of criminal justice. Reentry was listed, but a community leader who is interested in criminal justice reform had to check the box labeled other. Imagine if civil rights organizations and the African American leaders of the 1940s had not placed Jim Crow segregation at the forefront of their racial justice agenda. It would have seemed absurd, given that racial segregation was the primary vehicle of racialized social control in the United States during that period. This book argues that mass incarceration is, metaphorically, the new Jim Crow, and that all those who care about social justice should fully commit themselves to dismantling this new racial caste system. Mass incarceration, not attacks on a, not mass incarceration, not attacks on affirmative action or lax civil rights enforcement, is the most damaging manifestation of the backlash against the civil rights movement. The popular narrative that emphasizes the death of slavery in Jim Crow and celebrates the nation's triumph over race with the election of Barack Obama is dangerously misguided. The colorblind public consensus that prevails in America today, i.e. the widespread belief, i.e. the widespread, the, wi the widespread belief that race no longer matters, has blinded us to the realities of race in our society and facilitated the emergence of a new caste system. For some of the characterization of mass incarceration as a racial caste system may seem like a gross exaggeration, if not a hyperbole. Yes, we may have classes in the United States vaguely defined by upper, middle, and lower, and we may even have an underclass, a group so estranged from mainstream society that it no longer is in reach of a mythical ladder of opportunity. But we do not, many will insist, have anything in this country that resembles caste. I'm going to pause right there before I go on, before I go on, before I go on. So, when they're talking about criticism of the civil rights community and, like, what she made. Like, back in the civil rights, com when, when they were fighting for social justice and civil rights, one of the things they were attacking was a new Jim Crow because it was just like, what do you mean that my kid can't use that water fountain? You know, just, you know, it was blatant. You know, like what we had read earlier where it went from blatant things that you just don't say to kind of hush undertones of, you know, something that's hidden in a law. So, the fact that even though today we're not talking about the criminal justice system when the numbers are out of the roof and it's completely blatant and that if you just knew what was going on, you'd sit there and go, I think there is something going on. You know, you, you kind of got to open that up, open up that, 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 that kind of headed thinking, you know? So, and, and this is just a guided reading and I'm just 
asking questions and you know you don't have to respond you don't have to tell anybody your answers just kind of think to yourself you know uh have a moment of you growing you you know you can keep it all in your head right now i mean we got like we got like eight more eight more lessons to go and then let's see Heading back to the text. The aim of this book is not to venture into the long-running, vigorous debate in the scholarly literature regarding what does and does not constitute a caste system. I use the term racial caste. In this book, the way it is used in common parlance to denote a stigmatized racial group locked into an inferior position by law and custom used in common to denote a stigmatized racial group locked into an inferior position by law or custom. Jim Crow and slavery were caste systems. So is our current system of mass incarceration. It's the exact same. It may be helpful in attempting to understand the basic nature of the new caste system to think of the criminal justice to think of the criminal justice system, the entire collection of institution and practices that compromise it, not as an independent system, but rather as a gateway, a gateway into a much larger system of racial stigmatization and permit that permits marginalization. The term mass incarceration refers not only to the criminal justice system, but also to the larger web of laws, rules, policies, and customs that control these labeled criminals both in and out of prison. Once released, former prisoners enter a hidden underworld of legalized discrimination and permanent social exclusion. They are members of America's new undercast. The language of caste may seem foreign and unfamiliar to some. Public discussions about racial caste in America are relatively, relatively rare. We avoid talking about caste in our society because we are ashamed of our racial history. We also avoid talking about race. What did I say? Did I just mess it up? No, I, we avoid talking about caste in our society because we are ashamed to talk about our racial history. We also avoid talking about race. We even avoid talking about class. Conversations about class are Oh, sorry, I just had a profound moment of how we ask questions. We even avoid talking about class. Conversations about class are resistant in part because there is a tendency to imagine that one's class reflects upon one's character. That's why I paused. Like, that's a profound statement. Conversation about class are resisted in part because there is a tendency to imagine that one's class reflects on one's character. What is key to America's understanding of class is the persistent belief, despite all evidence to the contrary, that anyone with the proper discipline and drive can move from a lower class to a higher class. We recognize that mobility may be difficult, but the key to our collective self-image is the assumption that mobility is always possible. So failure to move up reflects upon one's character. By extension, the failure of a race or an ethnic group to move up reflects, reflects very poorly on a group as a whole. Okay, like, did y'all understand? Like, this is one of the excerpts from the book, but this is, uh, right now I'm taking my moment to pick, point something out to you. We recognize that mobility may be difficult, but the key to our collective self-image is the assumption that mobility is always possible. So failure to move up reflects on one's character. By extension, the failure of a race or ethnic group to move up reflects very poorly on the group as a whole. So, 
You know how like you get a lot of people who are saying, well, if you can't pull yourself up by your bootstraps and do this or do that, or, you know, I had this and that and I still did it, you know, or I lived in a one bedroom apartment with all 19 of my brothers and sisters and I grew up to own a business like, well, number one, that was back in the day and payment hasn't kept up with inflation. But also, if you're of another ethnic group and everything that we've just discussed in the 15 other paragraphs that we've just read through, like you've already been suppressed from, you know, the generation, 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 generation. So like, how does that statement reflect on that thought? You know, if you think about it, does that make sense? By extension of failure of a race or ethnic group to move up or fix. So, like, but what about if that entire group has been held down on purpose? Because, so that's why we today think that these stupid stereotypes that we base on people and go, no, it's real because it, do you see how things happen and how assumptions are made? Um, in my very first one where I was talking about Apple and Basil and their conversation that they had, and it was a mock conversation in Lesson 1 on my blog, www.southernfriedsocialist.com, Jim Crow Lesson 1. It talks about how to talk about race and racism and actually, you know, be kind, be nice, be polite. There, You can have hard conversations, but it doesn't mean you have to be hateful about it. So anyway, moving on. Going back to the, we're doing guiding, um, I'm doing um, teaching tolerance, um, the lesson plan for teaching the new Jim Crow, and the new Jim Crow is a book by Michelle Alexander, and yeah, it's an awesome book, and it's amazing, and you can see, if you go to my blog, you can completely, um, I've got the audio scripts for what we're talking about. Um, I'm, I am not affi personally affiliated with Teaching Tolerance, and I'm not affiliated with the book or the author. I just believe that it is a good message, and I found these teaching tools, and I thought, if not who, if not when. Moving on to our reading. What is completely missed in the rare public debates today about the plight of African Americans is that a huge percentage of them are not free to move up at all. It is not just that they lack opportunity, attend poor schools, or are plagued by poverty. They are barred by law from doing so. And the, and the major institutions with which they come into contact are designed to prevent their mobility. To put the matter starkly, the current system of control permanently locks a huge percentage of African Americans and their community out of the mainstream society and economy. The system operates through our criminal justice institutions, but it functions more like a caste system rather than, rather than a system of crime control. Viewed from this perspective, the so-called underclass is better understood, or viewed from this perspective, the so-called underclass is better understood as an undercaste. A lower caste of individuals who are permanently barred by law and custom from mainstream society. Although this new system of racialized social control purports to be colorblind, it creates and maintains racial hierarchy, much as earlier systems of control did. Like Jim Crow and slavery, mass incarceration operates as a tightly networked system of laws, policies, customs, and institutions that operate collectively to ensure the subordinate stat status of a group defined largely by race. There are important differences, to be sure, among mass incarceration. Jim Crow and slavery are three major racialized systems of control adopted in the United States to date. Failure to acknowledge the relevant differences as well as their implications would be a disservice to racial justice disclosure. Many of the differences are not as dramatic as they initially appear. However, others serve to illustrate the ways in which systems of racialized social control have managed to morph, evolve, and adapt to changes in the political, social, and legal context over time. Ultimately, I believe that the similarities between these systems of control overwhelm the differences and that mass incarceration, like its predecessors, has been largely immunized from legal challenge. Does that make sense? I'm going to go over that one more time. Ultimately, I believe that the similarities between these systems of control 
overwhelm the differences in that mass incarceration, like its predecessors, Jim Crow, has been largely immunized from legal challenge. So, my, and if you, if you want to go back until, go back through, but that part right there, if you don't understand it, go back and listen to, to a few of the things that we just talked about, because that's really, it's really starkly, kind of, but, but here's your, here's your complex question. The author introduces an analogy between mass incarceration and Jim Crow. This analogy forms a basis for much of the new Jim Crow's thesis. What will she need to do to persuade you of this profound claim? And what evidence would you look for as you read this book to know what, you know, what, what evidence would you look through? So, um, for anybody that's joined, I'm using the Teaching Tolerance um, lesson plan for the new Jim Crow. And um, right now I'm going through the new, or through the guided reading. And this is um, basically the juice of this chapter boiled down and I wanted to have a conversation about it. Moving on. With the benefit of hindsight, surely we can see a piecemeal policy reform or litigation alone would have been a futile approach to dismantling Jim Crow segregation. Let me say that one more time. With the benefit of hindsight, surely we can see that piecemeal policy reform or litigation alone would have been futile approach to dismantling Jim Crow segregation. While those strategies certainly have their place, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the con or and the consummate cultural shift would never have occurred without the cultivation of a critical excuse me of a critical political consciousness in the African American community and the widespread strategic activism that flowed from it likewise the notion that the new jim crow can ever be dismantled through traditional litigation and policy reform strategies that are wholly disconnected from a major social movement seems fundamentally misguided a new social consensus must be forged about race and the role of race in defining the basic structure of our society if we hope ever to abolish the new jim crow Last page, last page. The new consensus must be, must begin with a dialogue, a conversation that fosters critical consciousness, a key prerequisite to the elect, <laughs> my cat stepped on this and got my coffee all over this. So I'm like, what's this say? Fosters a critical consciousness, a key re prerequisite to the elective, elective social action. This book is an attempt to ensure the conversation does not end with nervous laughter. I'm glad that my cat stepped on that part and not on the other ones. <laughs> nervous laughter. What this book is intended to do, the only thing it is intended to do, is to stimulate a much needed conversation about the role of cr the criminal justice system in creating and perpetuating racial hierarchy in the United States. The fate of millions of people, indeed the future of the black community itself, may depend on the willingness of those who care about racial justice to re-examine their basic assumptions about the role of the criminal justice system in our society. And that, my friends, is the end of the lesson one. And then it goes into our footnotes. And I have all these footnotes available for you on my website. But I also am going to go ahead and put all the footnotes that I may, I may have gotten all tied up in reading and just didn't pay attention. I know you might not understand 10, 10 very well, but there's a way that you can get the, uh, uh, get the text and then you will know what it's talking about. But I just want you to have all the information to be able to make your own decisions. Because people making decisions for you is never good. So, let me see. Yes, yes, yes. Where's my thin button? Woohoo! There we go. Okay. So, 
we've gone through the guided reading for the first ever lesson of this. What I would like to happen next time is I would like to actually have people on here. I know it's super late. I had crippling anxiety and just didn't have the balls to do it. I know that sounds absolutely horrible, but I have anxiety. I'm one of those people. Um, I would love me some support. If you like this, please share it. Um, if you have a friend that's having a hard time understanding some stuff, please definitely point them our way. Um, my website has your vocabulary. It has the footnotes. It has um, sources cited. It also has all the links to the books references. So if you are upset about something or you don't understand something, there are plenty of ways in which you can find out the documentation in which that was found. And I would definitely want you to go do that. Um, I just want to start a conversation. And I think that where I grew up, there was not a lot of conversation on things that mattered. It's kind of a lot of whitewashing. Like, I went to school where it kind of seemed like everything was whitewashed. And I don't think that was right, and I'm sick of it. And I just don't know what I would do without, like, every. I cannot believe that he... The... The eight-year-old boy who was lynched by a bunch of teenagers last week, like, the fact that there are 14-year-olds who have picked up on that without being explicitly taught that means that we have a society issue and means that we throw around things or our society throws around things that really aren't funny and they're coming to fruition and then we sit around and wonder why they did things. And... There's a lot of racial things going on in um, Texas with our SB4, which is our Show You Your Papers. And I know that this isn't about, um, you know, Latinx Americans, but this is a good starting place. I know that this book, you know, kind of specifically talks about black males, but we're going to get to other things of that. And I'm hoping that my friend Denise would come on and tell me the um, non-whitewashed history of San Antonio, because I would really like to make that public, because I don't... You know, I wish I would have moved here and known how the culture really was and not just been whitewashed into it. You know, because I can, that hurts my feelings that somebody just erases somebody's culture or somebody erases somebody's feelings or somebody erases somebody's existence or makes them feel like they're less. So, anyway, thank you. Thank you for joining me tonight on the uh for well it's lesson two but the first ever live and please share it and if you want to whittle it down or cut it away into like little excerpts go ahead um i do know that i'm using all these materials because i'm not making money off of it and i definitely don't even have ads on my blog so i just think it's a really super important message and although i do have links to what i'm reading on my website i do encourage that if you can't buy the book or you can't afford it Go and donate to the author. Go and don't find her website and go and donate to her. If you can't buy the book and you're going by my audio, and then but definitely listen to the audio because it's a super important message. Thank you, and I appreciate you. And check out my blog www.southernfriedsocialist.com. Kitties, kitties, kitties.